Warning, I spoil most of the games I talk about here. I am very sorry. I love roguelikes so, so much. It is hands down my favorite genre in gaming. Of course, my opinions are a bit biased because of how much I love them, but I think there's certain components that make roguelikes inherently fun. They're difficult, they're filled with content, and there's something special about every single run you do. Depending on the game, the genre can even offer post-game options, co-op, endless looping, mods, some insane combination of game genre, or just some crazy appealing factor about it somewhere in between all of those. These factors are the whole reason why I own 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 48 of them. Jesus Christ. I have played a lot of roguelikes. Everything from the most iconic games which pioneered the whole genre, to the most obscure, insane roguelike which no one else gave a shot. This is so fucking hype. Throughout my years playing games in the genre, however, I have realized one thing which roguelikes fundamentally struggle in. And this took me a while to realize because frankly, it really doesn't affect the gameplay experience for me and that's honestly the only thing I care about. Roguelikes don't make narrative sense. Like, at all. I'm not saying their lore or world building is bad, no 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 no. What I mean is that the story they tell is, well, it can be a bit lacking, shallow, and poorly incorporated into the gameplay compared to many other games and genres. Let me explain. I don't want to start out with a super niche game, so let's use one of the most popular games of the roguelike genre as an example. Enter the Gungeon. For those of you which don't know, Enter the Gungeon is a very difficult roguelike bullet hell twin stick shooter where your character goes through a procedurally generated dungeon where you find all kinds of different wacky guns and items which you use to kill a whole bunch of random enemies and bosses. There's a regular ending and a true ending for each character called their past which you can beat to unlock additional stuff for the game. The character's past reveals some information about each character and who they were before they ended up in the dungeon, which is a pretty cool touch that adds to the whole gameplay experience. This game is very fun. 10 out of 10 on the Sagoon scale. That's it. Besides the whole past mechanic, the inner workings of the dungeon universe aren't really explained. You see what I'm trying to address here? There are tons of secrets and lots of theories out there from the community, but there really isn't anything which seems to be super concrete. And well, that's the problem. Something feels off. He said it! He said the name of the part! Oh my god! I don't want to suck the fun out of this game by asking these questions, but obviously, it seems like your main objective is to escape the dungeon. But why? Why are there guns and enemies here again? Why does the dungeon change every time? It can't be that large of a dungeon, right? And the absolute main question when it comes to all of these roguelikes is, from a logical sense, why do I come back to life when I die? I am literally getting lit up by bullets, lasers, acid, vomit, piss, and shit, and I just come back? Who dragged me out of there? These questions are definitely something to take into account. Not for me, because I'm not really the biggest story guy, more of a gameplay guy, but when you sit down and try to connect the dots, well, they don't. And, and it's okay if they don't, because you're too busy having the time of your life. Damn, this game is so good. Most roguelikes tend to be more gameplay focused and story focused anyway. Enter the Gungeon isn't the only game which has this sort of illogical narrative. Most other games in the genre have this same exact problem. This idea that if you think about the game's narrative, its universe, and its mechanics, it kind of just feels underwhelming. In roguelikes, you are usually introduced to a character and then given an end goal to reach. Other games also do this, obviously, but unlike roguelikes, there's a sort of journey you go through. There's plot twists, character arcs, emotional attachments, and so many other elaborate storytelling methods that make that journey so much more special. In roguelikes, your journey is broken up into like 500 different journeys, each with their own items, perks, playtimes, and are all canonically unsure of each other. This is what is referred to as a run. It's hard for a roguelike to have a coherent story, and this obviously breaks immersion when playing the game. However, I don't think it's the developers or game companies' fault. God no, some of these dev teams are the most passionate people I've seen in the gaming industry. Instead, I think the blame can be put on how roguelikes fundamentally operate.
right, time to get analytical here. The Google definition of roguelike is a style of role-playing game traditionally characterized by a dungeon crawl through procedurally generated levels, turn-based gameplay, grid-based movement, and permanent death of a player character. And I think that's a bit wordy and not up to date since the genre has evolved so much. So for the sake of this video, let's just define the roguelike genre as a video game genre that includes elements of permanent character death and procedurally generated content. For even more clarification, when I say permanent character death, I mean when a game places you at the start of the run with nothing when your character dies. And procedurally generated content means that everything is random, from map generation to loot. These two core factors, in my eyes, is what makes a roguelike. It's funny because these two exact core factors is what makes it hard for a roguelike to make narrative sense. In roguelikes, permadeath can sort of undermine the stakes of the game's universe. The idea that your character dying, or any character dying really, can be incredibly emotional and devastating depending on how the game goes about doing so. It creates very crucial elements of storytelling such as tension and pressure. It's hard to have those same stakes when your character is dying every 7 minutes. One of the main appeals of roguelikes is to get thrown into a circumstance which the odds are horribly against you and you die. But every time you die, you get stronger, whether that is through built-in progression systems, unlockables, or just developing the player's skills and game sense. From a gameplay standpoint, that's an amazing concept. But from a narrative standpoint, Eh, not so much. There's this lack of care for your character's narrative death, not only because of how much you die, but because right after you die, you expect to just start a run again and try to get farther. You tend to focus less on your character and instead focus more on the game. Every roguelike tries to recover some of these lost narrative points by having some sort of reason why the character comes back. As creative as some of these are, these reasons start to repeat themselves because of how hard it is to validate your character dying over and over again in a meaningful way. They're the power trip characters, characters that come back from death because of some sort of magical power or curse which they usually either obtained or were born with that prevents them from truly dying. Games like Ember Knights, Spirit Fall, and Cult of the Lamb do this. The problem with this trope is that it kinda doesn't matter what happens to the character because, you know, they can just come back to life. You technically have infinite tries at accomplishing whatever your goal is. Like, what's even the point? There are the disposable characters, where in certain roguelikes, instead of having a main character of the game, they have multiple characters which are either freshly generated or recruitable for you. Games like Streets of Rogue, Rogue Legacy, and lots of auto battler roguelikes all have this trope. The problem with this trope is that you really don't get attached to your character because right after your run, whether you win or fail, there's a small chance you will ever connect with them again the way you just did in your run. It makes the characters feel very disposable, hence the name, making them less of an actual character and more of a tool to beat the game. Lastly, the majority of roguelikes and their characters fall under this I give up, I don't know category, where the character just dies, loses a run, and then just somehow safely returns to the beginning of the game, or the lobby, or wherever the game starts you off. Games like Risk of Rain, Crypt of the Necrodancer, Enter the Gungeon, Across the Obelisk, One Step from Eden, Slay the Spire, Wizard of the Legend, Vampire Survivors, Gunfire Reborn, Binding of Isaac, Dead Cells, and I could just keep going on and on, man. The problem is that with this trope, it just doesn't make sense. Like what? I died a horrible death to whatever this is, and you're telling me I can just keep going? Along with this, the procedurally generated content doesn't make this narrative any better as well. When your character dies, comes back to life, and goes out again, there's some obvious inconsistencies which you see each time, especially if it's a dungeon crawler type of roguelike. A key part of building any sort of story is to have some sort of continuity and consistency. In most adventure games, you are usually given the option to roam anywhere in the game's world, and you can revisit your humble beginnings whenever you want. You don't have to in order to progress, but it gives the player the sense of free will to do whatever they want in the game's universe, and that's what makes it so immersive. And well, with roguelikes, the word procedurally is like the opposite of the word consistency. There are certain games which have actually tried to keep their maps consistent to improve their continuity and instead, they just procedurally generate the enemies and random hazards. Games like RoboQuest and PatchQuest. This helps the problem a little bit, but it doesn't fully make up for some of the narrative elements. Overall, it just adds this layer of speedrunning and optimized pathing to the game, which is completely welcome. The procedurally generated loot is also a bit confusing when you think about it. 
In most linearly narrative games, you get stronger as you play the game. And you know how it works. Over time, your Pokemon level up and evolve, Spider-Man progresses through his skill tree, and Kratos gets his 700th weapon. Like, no seriously, what is it? This is a graph of what your power level would look like in most other single player games. Very linear. Okay, now here's a graph of your power level in a single roguelike run. Depending on certain parts of the run, and what tools you're given, your power level spikes. And depending on the decisions you make, the sacrifices you take, the abilities you have, and the problems you're faced with, that level sporadically goes up and down. It's what keeps the game fresh and difficult, but again, makes no narrative sense at all. What's the whole idea of a journey when I get 8 crit glasses and 2 will-o'-wisps and it's not even the first loop? I'm not trying to say that the genre has to make narrative sense and have an amazing story, but rather, I'm just trying to address how hard it is for roguelikes to accomplish that. With all this randomness, permanent death, and continuity errors, it's very hard to naturally incorporate some form of remotely linear story into any roguelike. And the developers which make these roguelikes are very self-aware of that, which is why 90% of roguelikes out there tend to focus heavily on their gameplay while just providing enough fleshed out plot and world building to keep the player entertained. In the end, this doesn't really affect the enjoyment of roguelikes, it just sort of hinders its true potential by making that narrative element so hard to obtain. This is why when there are roguelikes that are actually able to accomplish that amazing narrative, everyone loses their shit. And trust me, there are two roguelikes I'm thinking of right now which do that. You hear that music? Yeah, you saw it coming. Of course I have to mention Hades. Hades is a dungeon crawling, hack and slash action roguelite, and the plot is so goddamn good. The story of Hades is both forced in front of your face, and also sprinkled throughout the game for the player to enjoy. And I think that's a really good balance, as most of the roguelikes, if they even have the goal of communicating an elaborate story, will usually force it all onto the player from the start, and then weakly bring it up later throughout your gameplay. This brings up a strong level of immersion when playing the game. The mechanics of the Hades universe has an extremely solid foundation, as the game obviously takes some of its world building from Greek mythology, and it uses that to build up its plot. You play as Zagreus, the prince of the underworld, and you are trying to escape to the surface, but his father, Hades, won't let him because he's so evil and no one is even supposed to leave his domain, whether they are dead or alive. Sounds super basic, right? Huge spoiler alert, the game kind of hides its plot from you which is an incredibly strong storytelling technique, which I am completely on board for. When you start the game, you're kind of just thrown into the goal of knowing that you need to get to the surface. This would usually make the game fall under a lot of different storytelling problems I just talked about, but the plot of Hades progresses a bit more as the player later finds out, through a series of flashbacks and memories, that the reason why Zagreus wants to get to the surface so badly is to reunite with his biological mother, Persephone. And it all makes sense. I could rant about the story for hours, and how everything lines up, how everything is so immersive, and how everyone feels so unique and full of life. Here are some story questions. Why does Hades not want you to leave? There are a couple reasons why. Hades doesn't like anyone leaving his domain, he also has a rocky relationship with his son and thinks he's lazy and weak, and Hades kinda sees Zagreus' attempts to flee as him escaping his responsibility to be the next in line to take over the Underworld throne. On top of that, there's a secret reason, that being to keep Zagreus away from Persephone. How are you getting these extra powers from the gods? Nyx, your adoptive mom, which you thought was your real mom the whole time, is actually putting you in contact with them to aid you on your journey to the surface, because she thinks you deserve to talk to your real mother. Extremely valid. Why did Persephone even escape to the surface? Well, you see, it's funny because she was actually just like a regular god of Olympus, but she had a super controlling mother, that being Demeter, and at some point, Hades fell in love with Persephone, but was scared to express her feelings due to the stricken cold presence which Demeter had over her daughter, and Zeus, one of Hades' brother, realized this, and as a gift, decided to personally send Persephone down to the underworld for him. And this is why Hades cuts off contact with Zeus and hates him because of this recklessness, basically separating Persephone and her mother, but despite how angry Hades is, he lets Persephone stay in the underworld where everyone loves her. Yeesh. You see what I mean? They have, like, the whole plot covered, man. There's a reason for everything. Every roguelike element has a pretty solid reason to be happening in the context of Hades' story as well. Because you're in the underworld, everyone is undead. You can't die again, which is why Hades made it so that Zagreus always comes back to the house when he's slain, restarting your run. It also justifies why you fight the same bosses over and over again, because no one is actually dying. Zagreus even remembers everything when he dies, and he even references his previous attempts in certain dialogues. 
Because the setting is heavily based off of Greek mythology, it makes sense that Zagreus has access to these legendary weapons. All of them are fairly reasonable for their time period and thematics, except maybe the gauntlets and the literal gun which are in there. They're kind of a stretch, but Supergiant decided to have some creative freedom with that, and I welcome it with open arms. Because you're going against your father's orders to stay away from the surface, it makes sense that Hades has ordered everyone in the underworld to stop you from doing so. He is literally the king of the underworld, so it's justified that he has that power. On top of the story and fleshed out mechanics, what puts a golden ribbon on this whole narrative experience is the fact that Hades is a fully voice acted game, which is very rare for many roguelikes. Achilles, sir, I have a very important question. Why do you detest onions so much? Have they wronged you somehow? As soon as you slice into one of those things, it makes you cry. Don't you find that a bit unsettling, lad? I won't shed tears over a cut-up vegetable. It gives the whole game an extra breath of life to its incredibly diverse cast of characters. My favorite is Artemis. Please, Artemis, give me a chance! Please, please, please! What Hades did was basically never seen before in a roguelike. And it's amazing that Supergiant Games sold over 700,000 copies within just its early access phase. That might not sound like much, but Supergiant Games is a hidden gem of an indie company. They aren't the most popular, but man, with games like Transistor and Bastion on the roster, they deserve a lot more in my opinion. Thanks Hades, 11 out of 10 on the Sagoon scale. The extra point is for the narrative. I bet you $10 you've never heard of this game, except this dude. He knows the game. Shout out to him, man. Chrono Arc is a roguelike party-based deck builder. It's similar to games like Save the Spire and Across the Obelisk, but has its own unique system and way of handling combat, and that's what makes it stand out, and I'm pretty obsessed with this game. On top of that, the story is incredibly intriguing and honestly borderline confusing. I'm pretty stupid. In Chrono Arc, you play as Lucy, the girl of the prophecy and it's explained to you in the intro cutscene when you start the game that the world has been taken over by darkness and that these smart people made a safe haven called the Ark so that people can continue with life. After living on the Ark for a while though, they realize that they're kind of trapped up there forever, but due to some random ass message, they learn about a random clock tower and if they activate the tower by finding these random lost time shards within the land of darkness, the world is restored. Lucy, being the girl of the prophecy, has a random magic power to find these time shards without getting lost, because the land of darkness is constantly shifting. Okay, now let's take a step back. Wow, that sounds like shit. There are so many vague terms and unanswered questions in there that it's almost laughable. Why is it this random girl again? Where did they get this message about the clock tower from? Why did the people in the Ark want to leave in the first place if the Ark is the safe haven of the world right now? What's even weirder is that the key pivot points in the story of Chrono Arc usually involve some glitch or mimic computer screen, and it just doesn't make sense both narratively and thematically when you first play the game. So that leaves us with a question. What the fuck is going on? The game is fun as hell man, but it just doesn't feel right. And that's because, yeah, something actually isn't right. We later learned in the game that the intro we were shown was kind of a lie. After your first successful run, the game glitches, and we learn that the world is not surrounded by darkness, but instead was engulfed by a harsh, unlivable winter. Humanity was basically doomed, but in order to at least mimic the idea of living, the scientists created the Ark System, which is actually a virtual world, and participants and inhabitants of the Ark are stored in these chirogenic pods, which house their physical bodies, while their consciousness is in the world that you play in. The characters they appear as being their virtual avatars. The cutscene which was shown in the beginning of the game is actually the backstory for the virtual world, while the new cutscene is the backstory of the actual world. We now know that Lucy's new overarching goal is to find out what's really going on and find some way out of the virtual system, as most of the game's plot is a mystery until you play through it. Wow! Oh my god. Because of this virtual world trope which your characters are stuck in, every roguelike mechanic is completely covered, because nothing really matters since they're just stuck in there anyway. Inside this virtual world, with each run you do, you progressively learn the real reasons behind the arc program, what every character's motives are, and the gradually unveiling plot. But what makes this game go that extra step in storytelling is the fact that Chrono Arc addresses one of roguelike's main mechanics into its plot. 
that being the looping system. The world loops strictly when Lucy dies. Actually, loop isn't the best word to describe it. It's more like the world restarts every time Lucy dies. This means the darkness is different every loop, everyone has the same dialogue before you head out, and your party forgets everything. Every time. Every horrendous loss, every decision you made, and how far you got is canonically forgotten by whatever party you were with. Except for three characters, Azar, Phoenix, and Lucy. Azar being one of the main secret antagonists of the game. Azar and Phoenix are already aware of this looping because they're lead developers or some shit, and Lucy slowly starts to remember all of her past attempts. And this is, uh, this is where the game gets very confusing. Shout out to the Chrono Arc fan court for explaining the whole thing to me, but it's still not clicking for me. I don't fully get the story. And it's crazy because I still think the story is so good. That's how intriguing it is. Again, I'm not the biggest story guy, and this community is incredibly small, so you damn well know there's no videos or wiki pages helping me out. Despite this, the game gives you so many cutscenes, records, and extra lore bits which you can watch and experience yourself. So if you actually have a functioning brain, unlike me, you would probably be able to piece together much more than what I have. Chrono Arc is a very meta game. When something is meta, it means that it is self-aware of its existence. A lot of video games have this trope where either the game or a certain character in the game is aware of what's happening outside of their perceived world, whether that is directly connecting to the player or just their known perception of reality. And I think Chrono Arc is one of, if not the only roguelike that has an emphasis on being meta. Characters like Sans from Undertale, Monica from DDLC, and Deadpool from Deadpool are just a couple examples of meta characters, and these characters use their awareness purposefully. They can invoke emotion, make the atmosphere very unsettling, or just know things for the hell of it. And Chrono Arc's characters use their awareness in a very pessimistic and morbid way. Like no, this game is pretty dark. The current ending of the game right now isn't even a happy ending. Instead of rambling on about the confusing story, which I can barely comprehend, let me give you an example of this game being meta, and personally, one of my favorite story events in the whole game. You are shown Lucy's 12th ever loop. This means her and her party, which is made up of Hein, Azar, and Leon, have died and restarted 12 times. Keep in mind, because this is Lucy's 12th loop, she is not as experienced compared to her 500th loop. They've set up a camp in the Land of Darkness for a quick break, and they talk about how the party has been dreaming about a science lab or being scientists. These dreams are actually presumed to be their remnants of consciousness in the virtual world. Azar, being aware of the looping, keeps note of this. After talking about their dreams, they go looking for a time shard, and they find it. Only to be ambushed by the World 1 Witch Boss, which is an actual boss in the regular game. Like you encounter this dude every time you do a run. The Witch has this boss mechanic where every turn, she'll put a curse card in your hand, which either deals damage over time, or applies a weakened status effect on a single party member. This is where you ask, why would I play this card? If you don't play the card by the end of your turn, that curse will apply to all of your party members instead of just one. So the best tactic would be to either funnel it all onto one party member that can handle it, or spread it among your party. Very fun mechanic. Chrono Arc uses this mechanic and applies it into the context of the narrative. Leon is a bit damaged, but she is the tank of the team, so she encourages Lucy to play the curse on her. Hind thinks this is a stupid idea because it might kill her, but Lucy does so anyway. The game forces you to. On the next turn, another curse is given to you and Leon is insisting that you play the second curse on her, stacking the damage over time. This could very much kill Leon, but Azar insists that it's up to Lucy's choice even though she's just an inexperienced little kid. The second curse is put onto Leon. She's barely keeping upright, and the witch notices this and takes full action. She summons a doll, and the doll shanks at Leon, and she basically dies. In the context of the game, this doesn't seem like a big deal, but this is in the context of the story. Leon has fainted. Her lifeless body lays on the ground as Lucy realizes what she has done. Azar tries to advocate for her decisions, or rather, the player's decisions, saying that this was all according to her plan, and the fight keeps going. However, Lucy is too scared to move. She is petrified. She looked up to Leon, and cared about her a lot. But now, Leon's blood is on Lucy's hands. Because she is so petrified in fear, she can't move. No, like, literally, she can't move. You can't play any of her cards. If you look at the difference between Lucy's 12th loop and Lucy's 500th loop, you can see the contrast of emotion. 
After dying 500 plus times, Lucy is used to seeing her friends all fall in front of her, but when she's only on her 12th loop, she barely understands what's going on. As Lucy stays paralyzed in fear, another curse card is placed into her hand, and you can't play it because of how scared she is, and that means that the curse is going to start stacking on everyone. And now, Hyde is about to fall. Bazaar asks if Lucy, or the player, has any other ideas, but she's still petrified. Bazaar shows disappointment in Lucy and the run, as he states that it's no use, revealing to the player that he knows what's going on. Bazaar is ready to move on to the next run, but Hein acts out on his own accord and goes berserk, instantly killing one of the dolls that the witch summoned. Bazaar, knowing that they need to restore the clock tower on Lucy's terms, tells him to stop, because Lucy wouldn't be improving if she had her party just carry her. Hein doesn't care and keeps going. He's a typical berserker type character, so he perseveres with the pain and keeps fighting with nothing but his raw anger. The witch is about to die, and Lucy recollects herself after seeing how strong Hein is. She realizes there could be hope, they could still make it, and Leon's death could be avenged. Azar's had enough though, and while Hein screams in rage, going for the final blow on the witch, Azar does the unthinkable. and slices Hein in half. Lucy is petrified again as she looks to Azar in confusion. He vaguely explains everything, how none of this matters and how Lucy will do better next time. And he walks away as we presume that Lucy dies to the witch. The glistening in her eyes fade as she starts to understand what is happening. And we loop again. Oh my- When I first played Chrono Arc, I wasn't expecting all of this. I, I just liked the concept of a party-based roguelike. But the unveiling story, the combat mechanics, and just the overall narrative was something which I haven't seen before in a roguelike. The characters and the art style of this game are amazing as well. All the characters are pretty fleshed out in their personalities. They each have witty dialogue in the virtual world, but also have their real life personalities which are hinted at through the extra records you watch. Hein is actually a nerd in real life by the way. There are 20 playable characters, not including Lucy, and they all have their fleshed out playstyles, synergies, and even team comps. My favorite character is Karon. PLEASE KARA GIVE ME A CHANCE PLEASE PLEASE Because of the combat system and the vast amount of characters, the main gameplay loop of Chrono Arc isn't only to progress through its unveiling story, but to also just become an expert at the game. Like this game is pretty difficult in my opinion, but some people just make it look so easy. It makes me want to play the game even more and study up on all the characters gameplay wise. Chrono Arc went on a whim and introduced an uncommon trope, and an uncommon combination of gameplay to the roguelike genre. And despite it being an incredibly hidden gem, I think this game deserves much more, man. 11 out of 10 on the Sagoon scale. Again, I don't think the point of a roguelike is to have an extremely fleshed out narrative. The point of a roguelike is for the player to die over and over again until they get so good at the game's inner workings that they can turn the most horrendous situation in their favor. Over the years, the genre has become pretty copy and paste due to how simple the concept of roguelikes are. This leads to developers experimenting with different genres and mechanics to make them stand out. Of course, this comes with its pitfalls and gameplay quality, but I feel like it adds healthy diversity to the beloved genre. We got roguelike creature collectors, roguelike beat-em-ups, roguelike dating sim- wait, what, what the fuck is it? The more drastic this innovation becomes, the harder it is for the narrative to make sense which is why people usually just don't care anymore and just focus on gameplay, which is completely valid. But just because something seems difficult to accomplish, doesn't mean that it'll stop people from attempting it. When the car was first invented, people designed it for ground travel, and no one would expect a car to fly. That would be pretty hard to do. But look at that, we have flying cars. And sure, it's not the most practical and easy thing to obtain, or even use regularly, but we have it, we can say that we have it, and just like how storytelling in roguelikes seems incredibly difficult, we have some games which actually achieve that. Of course, Hades and Chrono Arc aren't the only roguelikes with amazing narratives, but do I have the time and money to go scouring for more roguelikes like those? No. 
There are so many roguelikes out there, which means some of them are bound to go beyond what people expect from a roguelike. Some of them might be great, some of them might suck, but either way, every one of them is a very welcome addition to the ever-growing cesspool of what is possible in the roguelike genre. Thank you for hearing me ramble for over 25 minutes. Again, I would have talked about Inscription, but that game scares me, I'm a little bit-